Good afternoon. Welcome back to the class on the fundamentals of the Christian faith as these are understood from a certain historical Christian perspective. That perspective is um, encoded, if you will, in a document that is called the Heidelberg Catechism of 1563. That's the document that we have been following and have been using as our guide, if you will. I am cognizant of the fact that I have a potentially diverse audience, and I'm happy about that. I hope that folks from all sides imaginable uh, would take a moment to uh, review and look and follow and listen and by God's spirit and grace be open so that all of us can say when we're done with this class, the truth has set me free. Because that is the bottom line, only the truth. And as Christians, we claim that there is such a thing as truth. And not just truth generally, but absolute. And we claim that the word of God reveals absolute truth because the word of God is God's word and God himself is absolute. There is nothing imaginable beyond God. So all that we can think of, imagine, create, undertake in life, all of that would not be possible without the authorship of life that is God himself. He is the creator of life. He sustains life. He's intimately involved in life as we know it in this planet. And his presence is also everywhere else. So we are serving an unimaginably, unbelievably, if you will, using that in a certain sense, that word, a God who is beyond our way to comprehend. Theologians call that the incomprehensibility of God. God cannot be known by us human beings unless God reveals himself to us. So in his word, he has revealed to us what we need to know. For without that revealed will of his, we would all be lost. We are, according to the word of God, sinners. That's how we are born. And um, only the grace of God intervening can create a solution uh, to, this, to this dilemma. Um, and so this solution is found in the one to whom all of Scripture points, whether it's the book of Genesis or Samuel or the Psalms or the prophets. All these Old Testament writings point to the coming of the Lord in his son, Jesus Christ, revealed to us as the Savior and the Redeemer of sinners. So it's a wonderful class that we're looking at because it's basically a class that um, lays out for us the plan of God's marvelous redemption for us. The Heidelberg Catechism is a historical document. It's dated. You can tell that the issues of that day are reflected in the answers, even the questions themselves uh, that we find in this document. I've mentioned at the beginning that there are 129 questions and answers that are divided over three parts. And we've dealt with the first two parts. The first part dealing with sin, our problem with sin, and the second part with God's solution to that problem, namely uh, the salvation that he offers in uh, Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, born in the flesh. And so God has made provision for our sin problem in the Son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent to this world and who laid down his life for us by his sacrifice through death on the cross. We have looked at the uh, discussion of the plan of redemption uh, via the catechism's discussion of the Apostles' Creed. So we have ended that section that de details the person of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we have moved on 
to the doctrines regarding the church, that is specifically the sacraments. We have looked at the two sacraments that are uh, delineated, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper. And of the two of them, uh, we have concluded with the catechism that these are instructions that are closely following Scripture and that these uh, sacraments as signs, divine signs and seals, which God himself provides us with, uh, that they are used by the Christian in, in the ministry of the church to help us Christians remain strong in our faith. Strong not in our own ability to believe, but strong in terms of our faith in God, in God's reliability, his trustworthiness, his fidelity, if you will. So the sacraments are visually portraying what the scriptures verbally display and teach. So we have noticed with this catechism that there are only two sacraments and not the typical seven that the Roman Catholic Church still holds to, to this very day. The sacraments are privileges. They are not sh just simply rights. And these privileges are for people who have both confessed publicly their faith in Christ and they also maintain themselves um, in good standing inside the church. That is, they maintain the worship, the public worship, and they partake with believers of the sacrament, particularly of communion, on a regular basis. For the Reformation, the time in which this catechism was produced, the 1500s, uh, it was not an absolute right uh, to come and receive the sacrament and to partake of it. Uh, this right is given to the believer, the person who comes to an open and frank acknowledgement of sin and the need for forgiveness, which is found in Christ alone. And so the reformers closely linked the sacraments with a other aspect that was emphasized, and that is church discipline. So in church discipline, Christ rules the believer through his church, if you will, the ministry of preaching and teaching um, to cause the people of God to follow Jesus, putting it very plainly. Um, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So the church oversees the use and the participation by God's people in the sacraments. In other words, it's not just for anybody and everybody who happens to stop by on a given uh, assembly on the Lord's Day to then partake of it. It is a privilege. Going from there, we are Turning then to the last part today, uh, beginning, making a start today with the last part, and that is called the part of gratitude. I have it listed on the screen, and hopefully you can see that. Uh, part 3, gratitude, Lord's Day 32, question 86 asks, Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ, without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? And the answer it gives is as follows. Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also restoring us by his spirit into his image, so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for his benefits, so that he may be praised through us, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and so that by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. What a beautiful answer. What a meaningful answer. It was a relevant answer, pertinent answer, because at that time it had to be decided what was to be 
a proper understanding of this topic of good works. The Protestants, having come out of the Roman Catholic Church and tradition, the Protestants, having committed themselves to a doctrine of salvation that was based on the premise that a sinner is reconciled with God through faith alone, and that alone part is suggesting exclusivity because, for example, in Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul makes it plain that we are justified by faith alone and not by works. And that those who are justified, they prove their justification, they prove that they are children of God, that they have been born again by the Spirit of God, by doing good works. But notice, in that order. So we don't do good works in order to earn our salvation. That has been accomplished by Christ and Christ alone. And therefore, the justification that we need comes from another. It doesn't come from myself, it doesn't come from my parents, it doesn't come from my church, it doesn't come from my priest or pastor, it doesn't come from my sacrament of baptism. It comes from, directly from God himself. Because it is God who declares the sinner righteous. As Abraham believed, so must we. Abraham took God at his word. When God spoke to Abraham, Come and follow me. That's kind of one way of saying it. Like Jesus did to the disciples when he began his ministry. Come and follow me. God said to Abraham, come and follow me. Follow me to a place that, to a place that I'll point out to you. And how did Abraham respond? The Bible qualifies it as faith. And God credited it to him as righteousness. So, far, so Abraham has been coined and labeled then as the father of all who believe. So God declares us just and right, forgiven, at peace with him. What about good works? Do Protestants not really believe in good works? They do. And that is why the Heidelberg Catechism placed the law, the law of God, as we know it through the Ten Commandments, called the Decalogue sometimes, which is simply a word that means ten words. The Ten Commandments, in other words. And so God wants his people to be obedient, to be holy, the Bible says, without holiness, no one shall see God. And so Protestants take holiness very seriously. And that's why the Ten Commandments are discussed in the third part that we're going to take a look at in just a moment. Before we look at the Ten Commandments as the rule by which Christians show God their gratitude for their salvation, the Catechism then asks um, this next question, can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways? By no means. This is the Reformed response. Scripture tells us that no unchaste person, no idolater, adulterer, thief, no covetous person, no drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like, will inherit the kingdom of God. And the scriptures are there to support it very plainly. The Reformed community of believers in the world in the 1500s said, we take sin seriously. No person like that will inherit the kingdom of God. What then is involved in genuine repentance or conversion? 
two things, the dying away of the old self and the rising to life of the new. Romans 6, 2 Corinthians 5, and Colossians um, 3, 5 through 10. Dying away to the old Adam in us, rising to life to the new Adam, Christ in us. So the Christian is involved in a lifelong process of repentance or conversion. We have a constant need of being reminded of our sins so that we are called to turn around and to walk away, run away, if necessary, from it. What is the dying away of the old self? Follow-up question. To be genuinely sorry for sin and more and more to hate and run away from it. The Roman Catholic Church required also that those who came to the priest to receive um, absolution from their sins, that they would do so with uh, integrity, with, with sincerity. The Protestant um, formulation is likewise. It has to be sincere. It cannot be just outward, ceremonial, we just go through the motions. And I think that at the time of the Reformation, this was one of the problems, perceived problems for sure, in the Catholic Church of the time. Ever since then, this has also plagued the Protestant Church, that we go through the motions, that we sort of undermine our own faith in the faith alone, in Christ alone, when we have our own additions to faith alone, namely faith plus something else. Faith plus no drinking or smoking. Faith plus no makeup in certain evangelical traditions. Faith plus skirts only, dresses only for women or wearing hats. Faith plus psalm singing only. Faith plus homeschooling only. Christians have a way of adding to the plain, uncorrupted core truth that saves sinners. Faith in Christ, the Redeemer alone. When we add these other things by which we think that we make ourselves a little bit more clearly um, pure from the rest. That is a sad mistake. Sin must be hated. Sin must be run away from. And... The scriptures are there to support it. What is the rising to life of the new self? <laughs> Excuse me. The rising to life of the new self, wholehearted joy in God through Christ, and a love and delight to live according to the will of God by doing every kind of good work. That's question 90. Wholehearted joy in God. Who had wholehearted joy in God at the time of the Reformation? So many demands, so many expectations were placed on the people of God. So many additions placed on the simple, plain requirements that are laid out in Scripture that to have wholehearted joy in God was virtually impossible. Because joy in God became 
more like suffering a burden of expectations. That God blesses those who do good, who show by their activities, by their good works, that they love God. Wholehearted joy comes from knowing who I am in Christ, not from my good works. God loves me. God himself has wholehearted joy in me because I am in him a new creation. And so because of that relationship that God has forged sovereignly, we can wholeheartedly echo this answer and say that we have a wholehearted joy in God through Christ and a love and delight to live according to the will of God by doing every kind of good work. You see, the good work is necessary for us to be true Christians in this world. James says, without good works, a person's faith is dead. But to have a love and delight to live according to the will of God, that can only come from a person who knows that he is free, that she is free, because we have a newfound freedom, as Paul says in the book of Galatians, that is a freedom that no one ought to take or rob from us, not even the church. It is, a, it is a freedom that ought not to be compromised because it is a freedom that becomes ours by faith and by faith alone because it is centered on the person and work of Christ alone and the work that he accomplished, he did it all by himself. And so what he did is finished Redemption is accomplished, and through the sovereign working of the Holy Spirit, particularly inside the spiritual walls of church ministry, that redemption accomplished is being applied through the regular work and ministry of the Word and the sacraments. What are good works? Only those which are done out of true faith, conform to God's law, and are done for God's glory, and not those based on our own opinion or human tradition. Number of passages again are listed. Only those who are done out of true faith and that conform to God's law. That's very important to appreciate the message of the Protestant Reformation, whether you're a Reformed person or not, a Protestant or not, but just try to step into the mindset, and I think that part any of us ought to appreciate. Um, and that is that the focus is to conform our witness in this world on a platform, on a foundation that is beyond scrutiny. And so it's the word of God alone, because it alone is beyond scrutiny. We cannot say that about the church. Church is a wonderful institution uh, in its organized form, uh, many blessings for us. But the church is essentially people. The body of Christ is first and foremost the assembly of believers before it has anything to say about ordination, ordained ministry. The Protestant Reformation emphasized the office of all believers. And the ministry for some of those believers in the area of being a pastor or an elder or a deacon um, 
is a particularization of that general office that is of all believers. And so good works have to be done in accordance with an infallible rule, a rule that cannot err, that cannot make mistakes. It is God's infallible rule, his word. And by that law is defined what is a good work and what is not. And that is important because um, it's not based on our own opinion or human tradition. A person might say, but I think this about that. I think it would be such a good thing um, to do this or that. For example, in the area of worship, wouldn't it be wonderful if we did this or that? Recently, I read a letter that my mother had written. She just passed away from the COVID-19 uh, virus back in the Netherlands. I read an old letter that was probably dated somewhere in the 90s, 1990s. And in that letter, she expresses the, the sigh of burden that one of her neighbors expressed to her, that her husband had expressed to her when they had gone to church on a given Sunday. It was a Sunday when a child was baptized. And so in the part of that uh, baptismal service, the female uh, pastor had suggested that the congregation would join singing happy birthday. And the man afterwards expressed to his wife how he longed for a old fashioned, typical reformed, plain, Christ centered, I, I, I hope, service. There's nothing wrong with the song, Happy Birthday. But scripture doesn't demand or command that we use such worldly songs in worship. And so the word of God has to direct us in what we do and don't do in worship, but in every area of our lives. So good works are those that conform to God's law. And they are done for whose glory? Not yours or mine. Not the church's. God's glory. One of the five solas of the Reformation. Soli Deo Gloria. And then we have come to the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, they are listed because the Christian is obligated to keep them. To keep them as a rule, as a law that God places before us and we are accountable to it. We're held accountable to the law of God just because the Lord Jesus has come in the middle of the history of redemption um, doesn't mean that the law is no longer law, that the good law of the Old Testament has become a bad law because we're no longer under law but under grace. The law has its function, and we typically refer to that as a rule of thankfulness or gratitude in the life of the Christian, not the person who has to be redeemed yet, justified yet, but the person who has been justified, who, who believes, who's a confessing member of Christ's body. That person is called to obey the law of God out of a sense of gratitude, not to earn his or her salvation through that. What is God's law? And then it recites the Ten Commandments. And there they are. Um, I can read them, of course. The first commandment, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water, water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of the parents of parents to the third and fourth generation 
of those who reject me, but showing love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. And it goes on to the third, which uh, calls us not to make wrongful use of God's name. The fourth, uh, to keep the Sabbath. The fifth, to honor our parents. The sixth, to not murder. The seventh, not to commit adultery. The eighth, not to steal. Ninth, not to bear false witness against our neighbor. And the tenth, not to covet our neighbor's house, wife, etc. How are these commandments divided into two tables? The first has four commandments, teaching us how to live in relation to God. And second, the sixth commandments, five through ten, teach us how we uh, and what we owe to our neighbor. And on our next segment, we'll begin with the discussion of the first commandment. In conclusion, I will just say that John Calvin makes the observation in one of his uh, lectures on the minor prophets that um, when we say that we love God, God measures that love by the ethics to which we hold that are uh, laid out for us in the second table of the law. So it's not enough to say that you know God and believe in God and love God, but that love for God, as Jesus said, has to be proven. And that takes place in how we relate to our neighbor. Jesus summarized the law, and he used a summary that was already found in the Old Testament. He simply quoted it uh, when Matthew uh, recites that summary um, in one of the chapters there, to love the God, the Lord God, with all our heart, all our soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. On these two commandments lean all the prophets in the law. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be with you next time. God bless you.